people. I'm going to invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Titus as we continue this study in Titus together. Titus chapter 1, we're going to be looking at verses 5 through 9, discussing a depraved culture needs men of God. As you find your place, Titus chapter 1, starting in verse 5, the arts are a very good indicator of the state of a culture. Throughout history, the arts, whether that be um, drawings or music or other types of arts, typically are an indicator of what a culture is like during that time. Well, this year, in February of 2023, the Grammys hosted their big awards ceremony where they recognized spectacular work in the music industry. And the music industry is an area that really can express to you what the culture of your place is like. And during this year's Grammys, there was a, a, a man uh, by the name of Sam Smith, a homosexual with a transgender co-star that with the world watching in the United States watching and applauding and cheering, dressed up like the devil, like they were in hell, and uh, put on just a depraved and demonic show while everyone watched and cheered the state of our culture. It doesn't take much to look around and see. We are living in a de depraved and dark culture. Paul left Titus in Crete because the culture there was messed up also. And he's given him instructions to set straight the mess, to set straight the brokenness. And a depraved culture, here's what a depraved culture needs. It needs men of God. And you're going to see that today. Look with me, starting in verse 5. The reason I left you in Crete was to set right what was left undone and as I directed you to appoint elders in every town. An elder must be blameless, the husband of one wife, with faithful children who are not accused of wildness or rebellion. As an overseer of God's household, he must be blameless, not arrogant, not hot-tempered, not an excessive drinker, not a bully, not greedy for money, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, righteous, holy, self-controlled, holding to the faithful message as taught so that he will be able both to encourage with sound teaching and refute those who contradict it. We got a picture there of what a man of God is supposed to be like. In a culture that is broken needs men of God to live out God's standard. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we ask that you would help us see today what a man of God is supposed to be like. And help us to understand that you are calling us as your people to live lives not like this world, but in accordance to your word of God. God, help us to be holy as you are holy. God, help us as a church to put our, our minds, our eyes to your text. And Holy Spirit, may your word enter into our hearts and change us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, you see it there in verse 5. Here's where it is. Verse 5, he says, The reason I left you in Crete was to set right what was left undone, or to, to set straight. Paul has left Titus in Crete to set straight what is broken. Now, the word here for set right or set straight is the Greek word, word epidorthos. In that word, you can hear, you can just, you can hear it in the middle of that word, epidorthos, ortho. Orthopedic. It's where we get our word orthopedics or orthodontics. 
And what happens in orthopedics? Well, if you're like me, I've had a broken limb before. I broke my arm. When I was in middle school, I was playing basketball, and I ran down the court in a game, and I did something they call, I took a charge. And what that is, is you stand there in front of somebody that's steamrolling ahead, and they're going to the basket. You stand there, and you don't move. And when they hit you, and you go falling back, it's a charge, and you get the ball because they just ran over you. And I sprinted down the court, got in front of somebody, stood there and took a charge. And when I went back, I put my arms back, and I knew it. As soon as I hit the ground, I could feel it. It was gone. I laid there on the ground, and afterwards my dad said, we just thought you were down there trying to make it seem like they should give you the call. We were wondering why it's taking you so long to get up. But they, they got me to the hospital eventually, and there at the hospital, they said, yeah, that arm is broken. It's broken. And, and here's what an, an orthopedic surgeon or doctor does. They take a broken bone that's been broken in two, and what do they do? They put it back together. They set it in place. They set straight what's broken. And if you don't set straight what's broken, then that limb's going to be deformed. It's not going to mend back together the right way. It's not going to have the right type of function. It's not going to operate correctly. And so you got to go to that orthopedic person, and they got to put you back together. they got to set that bone in place and put a cast on it so that it will mend back properly. In a depraved culture that is broken, we need to be put back together the right way. And God says, I'm the surgeon. His word is the surgeon, the scalpel that takes what's broken and puts it back the way it's supposed to be. A depraved culture needs a right church. A depraved culture needs a strong church, a clear church. Crete was a mess, and it needed men of God. And so the first order that Titus will, will do is he will set straight what is broken by appointing elders in every town to lead the church in Crete. You see it there in verse 5. Appoint elders in every town. Now, the word here, elder, is really one of three different words in Scripture that all refer to the same person. A lot of confusion out there about this, but it's really clear in Scripture. There is the office of pastor, and the office of pastor is referred to in three different ways in Scripture. The word elder, the word overseer, and the word shepherd. That's what the Bible says a pastor is. Elder, overseer, shepherd. You see two of those right here in this text. We see the word elder. Then you move on to verse 7 and it says as an overseer. There's the second word, the second title given for that title. And then in, in 1 Peter chapter 5 verses 1 and 2, you see all three of them together. Okay, And so these are all three words that are synonymous for the same office, the office of pastor. Churches need pastors, men of God who proclaim and preach and teach and stand up in according to the word of God. Crete is this large island in the Mediterranean Sea. There are several churches all throughout Crete to, to, to be scattered so they can reach all the people there on that island. And what Paul says is those churches, they need elders. They need pastors in that church to lead the church. An elder is about a pa how a pastor is viewed and approached by people. So you think about how you used to be told, and we need to still teach this today to our kids. What, what am I about to say? Respect your elders. Respect your elders. Well, what do we mean when we say that? We mean you recognize that that person is mature. Uh, that, that they deserve respect, that they deserve honor, okay? And so all throughout culture, there has been a reverence for those that are in authority over you. We say to our kids, they need to respect their teacher. That, that's your elder over you. You need to respect them. You need to respect your Sunday school teacher. Well, listen, 
when it comes to elder here, it's talking about how a pastor is to be viewed by the church and by people and how he's to be approached by people. And so an elder is someone that is respected, a person with wisdom and maturity and respected by people. It doesn't necessarily mean that an elder has to be, you know, 80 years old. Okay? Titus was a young man. So was Timothy. And Paul tells them, hey, as an elder, here's what you need to do. Not only uh, is that word elder, but we see that word overseer. An overseer uh, is discussing the aspect of responsibility to lead the church. And so a, an overseer pastor it has a responsibility. A responsibility to lead the church and to make decisions. And then that other word is shepherd. We see that in Scripture talks about the spiritual responsibilities of a pastor, spiritually to care for the souls of people, to protect the sheep, protect the church against the wolves, to, to feed the sheep the word of God, to, to care for the soul of the church with the word of God. And so we see three names given to the same title or office as pastor. It's elder, overseer, and shepherd. Okay, now that's what Titus is to do in Crete. He is to appoint elders in this role. Hear me, this is important. Wrong pastors make broken churches. Broken churches create a broken culture. You've heard it said before that the, the reason that, that the world or, or our nation is in such horrible shape is because the family. When you lose the family, you lose the nation. Well, I'd like to take it a step further. I think it's when you lose the church, you lose the culture. And when you lose the church, you lose the family. Wrong pastors create broken churches. Weak pulpits make weak churches. So we have a weak culture because we have weak pulpits all across the United States of America. We have a weak culture because we have weak churches. In verses 6 through 9, God gives us the qualifications for a pastor. Now, before you check out and leave, this does apply to you. Okay? All right? Let me give you two reasons why this applies to you. Number one... God calls you to be underneath a pastor. And so God calls you to be a part of a church, and the church is to be led by a pastor. And so because of that, you're called to sit under a pastor and under his leadership and under his preaching, uh, all of those things. Okay? So that applies to you. You should want to know what the qualifications are for a pastor because you're going to sit underneath one. You might one day move from Hamilton County three or four hours away. If you're just an hour away, you can still come to our church. But you might, you might go further than that. And guess what? You're going to have to go find you a church. You need to know what a pastor is supposed to be like. One day you might be at a church somewhere, and that church needs to call a pastor. And you might be on the search committee. You need to know what a pastor is supposed to be like. And so this applies to you. It also applies to you in another way. Listen, the call of a pastor is a high calling. And the standard set by God is a high standard set by God. But hear me now, it's a standard we should all aspire to. Yes, it's a high standard. And it's a high calling. But it's a standard all of us who are, are believers should aspire to. God is not calling us as believers downward. He's calling us upward. God will not lower his standard just because the culture changes. Jesus, hear me now. Jesus is our ultimate standard. We should all be striving and aspiring to be like Jesus. 
and the standards that God gives us for pastors just gets us a little bit closer to being like Jesus. Ultimately, Jesus is who we want to be like. So I want to give you quickly a, a summary of the list of qualifications. We're going to move through these quickly, okay? But I want to give you a summary list of these qualifications. Number one, a, pa- a man of God is to be a quality family man. Number two, a man of God is to be a man of character. And number three, a man of God is to have biblical convictions. And so let's pick up in verse 6, and it says here, An elder must be blameless, the husband of one wife, with faithful children who are not accused of wildness or rebellion. We see it right there. A man of God is to be a quality family man. It's all about the family in that verse. It starts by giving the word blameless. He's to be blameless. That word means to be above reproach. It means that there will be no accusation brought against the man that will stick. There may be false accusations, but when those accusations are held up to the light, they dissolve away because an accusation won't stick against that man. That's what it means to be blameless. That's what a man of God is supposed to be like. A man of God is a quality family man. It says in verse um, 6, the husband of one wife. That literally means a one-woman man. A one-woman man. Friends, that's not just for the pastor today. Men in here, God's called you to be a one-woman man. That's what he's called you to. He's called you to, to, to marry that woman, the love of your life, and that she, until death do you part, is to be the apple of your eye. End of story. God's called you men to be a one-woman man. He's called the pastor to be a one-woman man. Anytime a, a man cheats on his wife in any type of way, He has sinned against her, and he has sinned against God. And when it comes to the pastorate, if a man of God, a pastor, cheats on his wife, he has disqualified him from the pastorate. That's a high standard, but that's the standard of God. Uh, There's a church in our town. I I, I Googled it last night because there were things going on with it the last couple years, and I just they came to my mind. I Googled them last night, and when I pulled up, the Google, uh, th- their web page, it said, closed permanently. And I know what happened in the last couple years. Magazines and people were saying this was the fastest, one of the fastest growing church in America. And they wanted everybody to know about it. And er- people were flocking to this church. And then the pastor got caught cheating on his wife. On video. And then that pastor stayed with the church. Refused to leave the church. He started it. He was going to stay there. I just happened to look last night and it said permanently closed. Well, I dug a little bit deeper. With the same name, the church is still operating. They're just operating now in Ringgold, Georgia. But I'm here to tell you, friends, that's wrong. That's what's wrong with our culture today. Because weak churches create a weak culture. Weak pastors create weak churches. And the Bible's clear. That man is disqualified from the ministry. Now, that's just what the Word of God says. And God is a God of grace and forgiveness. And there's still plenty more things men can do with their lives for the honor and glory of God, even after making egregious mistakes and sins. But one that you can't do is pastor the church. That's just the word of God. When the church puts up with this kind of mess, it's no wonder our culture is in a sexual revolution. Not only is he to be a one-woman man, but he's to have children of faith. A pastor's to have a home life that's conducive to kids who believe. Kids will call out hypocrisy faster than anybody else will.
the way a pastor lives at home can very much have a negative impact upon his kid's life and spiritual life, and they will see that hypocrisy and call it out, and it will affect them the rest of their lives in terms of their walk with God or lack thereof. Ultimately, a child's faith, though, is a spiritual work of God. And so, even in a godly home, there, there still will be prodigals. That's just, that's just the reality. Because when it comes to faith, no one in this room can make anyone have the faith that you need to have in order to be saved. It's a personal decision you make, each of you individually, through the work of God in your life. But the, the point is clear here in this passage of Scripture. And here, here's the point. If a man can't love his wife and his children and lead them in the way of Christ, he can't lead the church. And so a man of God... Must be a quality family man, and a man of God must be a man of character. Look at verse 7. It says, As an overseer of God's household, he must be blameless, not arrogant, not hot tempered, not an excessive drinker, not a bully, not greedy for money, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, righteous, holy, self controlled. In verse 7, what we have is five negative character traits, followed by six positive character traits, and it began with the same way verse 6 began, talking about being blameless, once again, without accusation, without an accusation that can stick. A man of God must be a man of character. So let's quickly talk about these five negative traits, then followed by the six. Verse 7, not arrogant, not arrogant. A man of God can't only be concerned about himself. He puts others before himself. He can't be arrogant. Not hot-tempered. A man of God shouldn't be someone quick to get angry. Not an excessive drinker. Now the New King James Version puts it like this. Not given to wine. So I'll just say it like this for you today. Alcohol is not for the man of God. Not, not a bully or violent. Now, there's a couple ways that you can be a bully or be violent. You can be violent with your fist or you can be violent with your voice. A man of God should not be a bully or be violent in either way. Not greedy for money. A man of God is not in it for the money. A man of God isn't consumed with money. So not greedy for money. But here's the positives. Hospitable. Friendly. Towards others. That's what a man of God is supposed to be. In fact, the word... The word hospitable, hospitable here literally means friend of strangers. So a man of God should be someone that's friendly and caring towards others, loves good things. And so what does it mean to love good things, to be a lover of good? What are you associated with? Are you associated with good things or bad things? Do you listen to good music or do you listen to the top 100 charts? And let me just say something. I looked into that and talking about our culture, the music today that our kids and everyone listens to on the radio and everywhere else, it is literally pornographic. It's literally pornographic. Do you associate with good things or bad things? Sensible. That, that means to, to be in control of your passions and desires. Righteous, committed to doing what's right. A man of God is to be a man of integrity. Holy, that is set apart, devoted to God. A man of God is to be devoted to God. The Bible says God has set us all apart in our salvation. We've all been set apart from sin unto God. Devoted to God. 
and to be self-controlled, disciplined, and in control of his actions. And so a man of God is a man, a quality family man, a, a, a man of character, and then finally a man of biblical conviction. Look at verse 9. It says, holding to the faithful message as taught, so that he will be able both to encourage with sound teaching and refute those who contradict it. Biblical conviction. That's what's lacking. One of the things that's lacking in our culture. Is the church actually having conviction. Biblical conviction. See. A man of God is to proclaim what is right, true, and good and encourage people in that. And a man of God is also to proclaim and condemn what is wrong and sinful. And so he says here, holding to the faithful messages taught so that he'll be able to both encourage what is right and good and refute, condemn what is not good and sinful. And how does a man of God do that? How does a man of God have biblical conviction? He tells us right here. It's this, it's this phrase. Holding, holding to the faithful message. Holding fast to the word of God. Holding on to, with a firm grip, the scriptures. And so he says, hold fast, hold on tightly to the faithful message, the, the word of God, and proclaim it. Convictions, your convictions, are to be formed not by culture, but by the living word of God. That's, just, that's it. And a man of God must have strong biblical convictions about the word of God. And he must hold on to that tightly and firmly. I've never been deep sea fishing on one of those charter boats. I've always thought it was, would be fun. I'm talking one of those where, you know, there's about eight people on it. Not the big boats where they just take you out there and you catch sea bass. I mean one of those where they're like, we're going to put you on some marlins. Or some sharks. Something big. And they, and they get you out there and there's about eight of you on one of these little charter boats. And, but I, I, I've seen people do that on TV. And they get them out there, they get them ready. And... The captain of those ships, they know when one of those big fish are there and it's about to go down. You know what they do? They get that angler. They get them in position. They put a harness on them. I mean, they basically lock him down to the ship and they tell him, you hold on to this rod and you don't let go. You hold on with everything you got. And boy, when that, when that big fish comes and gets a hold of it, there is a fight, there is a battle going on, and it's going to go on for hours. And, and it gets to the point that all that person can do, boy, they are just holding on. They can't let go. They're holding on fast, holding on tightly until they land that fish. God tells us as his people and tells the men of God that when it comes to your convictions, you better hold on to the Bible and you never let go. Hold on firmly and tightly. If you're going to be a person with biblical conviction. You know, as we think about the qualifications here of men of God. It gives me one final thought. How can anyone perfectly live up 
to this standard set in Scripture. How can anyone not just at least one time pop off and get angry in an unrighteous way? I got good news for us. There's one person who lived a perfect, sinless life, who is our ultimate example. His name is Jesus. Jesus came to this earth. He committed no wrong. He lived a sinless life. He was perfectly blameless. No accusation could be brought against him. They brought accusations against him. They crucified him on false accusations. And as he was hanging there on the tree, the soldiers looked up and they said, Truly, he has committed no wrong. Because he was without sin and is without sin. And all of us in this room, we have committed sin against Almighty Righteous and holy God, but thanks be to God, by His grace, He says, I will forgive you of whatever sin you've done. Whatever you've done in the past, I will forgive you of it. I will set you free of it. I will cleanse you of it, and I'll give you a new life. But you've got to place your faith and trust in my Son, Jesus Christ. If today... You want to be the man that God has called you to be. It starts by you giving your life to Jesus. Because you can't do it without His power in your life. If you today want to be the woman that God has called you to be, it starts today by placing your faith and trust in Jesus. Because you will not, you can't be the woman God wants you to be unless you've got the power of Christ in your life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father... We thank you for your word. And God, it's a humbling experience to get before your word and for it to challenge us and to teach us of what you've called us to be as your people. Father, I know that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but thanks be to God that Jesus has taken our place, lived a perfect life that we couldn't live, died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin, and has been resurrected from the grave to give us his life through his resurrection. Jesus, we praise you, we worship you, and God, may you create in us a strong desire to live lives that honor you. Lord, we believe that if our world is going to be impacted with the gospel and if our culture is going to be changed for the positive, that it's going to start right here in this room with men and women of God who live according to your standard. God, help us to see how important this is. Help us to decide today to follow you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you would please.